Hi, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a data scientist at DataCamp, and I'm here today with Ben Balmer. How you doing? Good. <laughs> so uh, Ben and I just finished recording videos for his new course on uh, correlation and regression. It's going to be part of our intro stats series on the R curriculum, which I'm really excited about. As am I. So it's good to have him here. Um, so I have a few questions lined up. Um, and the first is familiar uh, to our audience. It's the same question I ask everybody. So I'd like to know, okay. uh, there are many labels that people apply um, to uh, people working in our field, data scientist, data analyst, statistician, quant, hacker, et cetera. Right. Which of those um, do you, and this is not a loaded question given that you're working on our, our stats curriculum, which of those do you apply, uh, associate with the most and why? Okay. Well, of course, Nick, I reject all labels, but, <laughs> uh, but no, I would identify as a data scientist first, and I think that's because I don't really fit. So between mathematics, computer science, and statistics, I sort of, I fit in those boxes in some way, but mm -hmm. not cleanly in any of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, given my background and um, some of the stuff that I've worked on, I think data scientist best captures like the kind of stuff that I have done and the kind of stuff that I'm interested in, which, you know, kind of spans those disciplines. Okay. So just to recap, uh, so is, is that sort of a, an indirect way of defining data science to you? Is it like... Um, uh, you know, there are some ways in which I feel like if we could start from scratch, um, data science would be a superset of statistics and computer science, maybe mm -hmm. not math. Um, but that, you know, in, instead of being this new thing that has to, like, fight for space, like, maybe if we had not had those things, you know, in place before, like, mm -hmm. maybe those would be considered subfields of data science. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah, there's there's some, some Venn diagrams out there. Yes, there, um, there are many Venn, Venn diagrams. Many Venn diagrams that attempt to explain what data science means. And yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's, it's obviously a vague notion, and there will, there's no perfect definition. But right. um, so it often includes uh, what you said, stats and computer science, but then maybe with the addition of uh, domain expertise. That's right. How important yeah. do you think that is? Well, for me, I think it's really important. Um, you know, and my my domain of expertise is baseball sabermetrics, mm -hmm. um, and it's not hard to imagine. Um, you know, all the kinds of like uh, technical knowledge that people have, and also just um, knowledge from watching the game that's built up over decades, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it's one of the things that we try to emphasize in our classes and we try to impart on our students that, you know, you can have all these technical tools, but if you don't understand the field of application and, you know, how to, like, use the language of that domain and how to explain these, um, what can be very complicated and technical things to people in those fields, then, like, I'm not sure what the value of your work really is, right? Sure. So, yeah, that's really important. Okay, great. So that's a perfect segue into my next question. Okay, perfect. Um, tell the good people uh, what you do now. Uh -huh. um, and you also had a very non-traditional path getting there. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you could just take people uh, briefly along that, that journey. Yeah, sure. Um, how much time do we have? A lot, <laughs> no. as much as you need. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm an assistant professor of statistical and data sciences at Smith right now. Um, in the great state of Massachusetts. In the great state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. yep. And, um, you know, so I teach uh, some traditional statistics classes, like the intro class um, and, like, a multiple regression class, uh, but also some data science classes, like specifically branded data science classes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think that's been a great fit for me. Um, my PhD is in math, and the graduate training that I had was in discrete math. My thesis advisor was a theoretical computer scientist. Um, and then at the time, I was working for the New York Mets as the, uh, their statistical analyst. So you were a data so scientist before this was even a thing. That's right. You yeah. were already doing the domain expertise right. with the computer science and yeah. the stats and the and, math. And yeah. we didn't call it that, right? Yeah. So it wasn't called data science, but yes, absolutely. That's, at the that's time, what it was, the was just called was. overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, tell people... Um, yeah, so, so specifically, mm -hmm. the, fir the first job that you had out of yeah. college was quite unique and interesting. And Yeah, well, there were others. but yeah, Okay, there were others, but you know the one I want to zoom yeah, in that's, on. Yeah, that's the big, let's, big one. Let's talk a little bit about that and um, what was exciting to you about that 
-hmm. and then how you ended up going from there to where you are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I, it's not that complicated to imagine what's exciting about working for a baseball team, right? I mean, I don't know. I've been a baseball fan my whole life, played baseball yep. um, at various levels. Um, not very well, but, you know, I enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so to get a chance to work for, you know, what happened to be my favorite team, uh, the New York Mets, um, you know, I, I'd say it was a dream come true, except it wasn't a dream because jobs like that didn't exist when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was very exciting. And, you know, I think the best part of that job was feeling like you're part of something that a lot of people care about mm -hmm. that, um, you know, has very defined successes and failures. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had both of those things during the time I was there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's very exciting. Um, and, and yeah, it's quite different from the job I have now. Um, not so much in terms of the work that I'm doing, but just, you know, the environment and the kind of people that I'm surrounded with. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things I like best about my job now is I'm never bored. Mm -hmm. Like every day is totally different. Um, and, you know, to get the chance to work with the students that are, you know, as talented as, as our students are and to get a chance to then, you know, see them go on and like do great things afterwards is like really gratifying. Um, so one of the things that I know you're really passionate about and one of the reasons you're working with us is you love education. Um, were you involved in any training or education in your previous job and was that a big motivator for you uh, uh, coming to the academic world? Yeah, yeah. So it's funny you asked that, but um, yeah, so, I, you know, I was in graduate school at the time that I was working for the Mets for a, a, a large portion of that time. Um, and so, yeah, um, we had interns coming in every summer, and uh, some of those interns, you know, were working with me on various projects, and, you know, because of the nature of my work, uh, I was doing a lot of um, SQL development mm -hmm. and, like, PHP development. And um, so, so getting like interns kind of up to speed with writing basic select queries in SQL was like a way for them to like make progress in terms of like being able to do quality work that would that would help us, you mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a number of interns that we had that like took to that right away and really took off. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, we um, we implemented a um, a kind of like uh, inter office. Um, you know, baseball, I think we called it baseball 101 or something like that. Um, but, you know, to kind of to talk about the rules, not the playing rules, but like the administrative rules, which mm -hmm. are like really complex, um, you know, covering contracts and things like that. Um, and then also like, you know, basics of SQL and like some of the data sources that we yeah. worked with. So we did actually implement some of this stuff. It wasn't just me, but like that yeah. was part of what we did. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And now um, that you're uh, a tenure track faculty member at a liberal arts College teaching mm -hmm. is again a very important part of what you do. Yeah. Um, maybe just talk briefly about that and, um, and and some of the things that you've learned since you've been doing it. Yeah, I mean, so teaching is something that um, you know um, I actually come from. <laughs> like my father is a professor, my grandfather, um, so it's something that I've always thought about. Um, mm -hmm. It's never something that I. Uh, it's not like I like the dream of my life to become a professor or anything. Mm -hmm. um, just that sort of worked out that way. Um, but again, I, you know, I think just what's most gratifying for me is like seeing some of these students at this stage of their lives. Um, and, you know, our students are all intelligent, like capable people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's at this moment that I like have something that I can teach them, um, that they can take with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like some of my students, it's like if it were two years later, like, they'd already be beyond me, you know? Mm -hmm. sure. But, like, at this stage, it's like I can still kind of offer them something. So um, you've been doing this long enough now that you've had, you've, you've heard from st some students who have gone on to do other things and t had taken a class with you. Yeah. What are some of the things that they say um, were most valuable for them, some of the most valuable takeaways that they had from, from the courses you taught? Well, I think, um, you know, first and foremost is like the experience of working with real data, mm -hmm. um, which, as you know, does not always come to you in the way that it does in some of the more traditional statistics textbooks. Yep. So, um, you know, the ability to work with real data, the ability to, um, to learn coding, you know, mm -hmm. so like, you know, whether it's R or Python or whatever it is, you know, that ability to write code, um, to work with, to work you know, to do what you want with the data that, that you have to work with, mm -hmm. um, I think is something that people sort of consistently say is like a rewarding thing that they learned in these classes and then that 
they actually that was actually useful to them in their in their jobs and their future mm -hmm. careers. So has the word gotten out that like when somebody takes your course, they're going to have to program? Is this a surprise to, to uh, most people, or or is it now I, accepted that this is just a part of doing statistics? I think so. Yeah. Um, and on, and I I basically say that on the first day of class, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little different, you know, in the intro stats class where a lot of students are taking it because it's required for their major um, versus like a data science class where they're all taking it because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, basically my, my message is, um, I don't know, if you want to do this kind of work and you want to do statistics or data science in this day and age, like you want to do it right, like you have to learn to code. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a master programmer or that you have to learn a whole bunch of different languages, but like... Mm -hmm. You gotta you gotta learn how to how to create something for yourself, mm -hmm. um, and that's ultimately like an empowering thing, um, and it's something that I try to yeah I try to convince them of. So it's a perfect segue into my next question. Um, so uh, you mentioned creating something for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You've created at least one R package, mm -hmm. um, ETL. Mm -hmm. It's a, an R package that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. um, which stands for Extract, Transform, Load. Correct. Um, yeah, maybe it'd be useful to just give a brief explanation of um, why you built that package. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to talk about the technical reasons, but I'm actually curious like, what motivated yeah. you to create the package in the first place. Um, and why you think it's important for other people to do similar things. Okay. Um, well, like most people who create R packages, I did it to solve a problem, right? So like I had a problem and I wanted to solve it and I realized that if I can solve this problem for myself, like maybe I can solve it for a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. And um, in this case, the problem is if you have uh, what I've been calling a medium data source, right? So it's not small what, data. What, what does that mean? For okay, you? so so small is like data that fits in memory, no problem. Okay. Right. An Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, you know, big data is like something that involves clusters and multiple computers and mm -hmm. terabytes, and, and I'm not talking about that either. So this is like, you know, on the order of like a couple gigabytes. Like, so a data source with, like, a couple gigabytes worth of data. Sure. It's not an Excel um, spreadsheet. It's not Facebook, Google scale data. It's something exactly. in the middle. Yep. Something in the middle. And there are a lot of data sets like this. A lot of the data sets that I worked with uh, in baseball were, were of this sort of magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that, like, you know, so just reading the data into R in a data frame is, like, maybe not so um, feasible. It's not sure. a great solution. Um, but, like, SQL is, like, a reasonable solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. But then, um, you know, to go through that process, so this ETL process that you talked about, extract, transform, and load, that means um, downloading the data from some server on the internet, mm -hmm. transforming it into some kind of um, tabular format, and then loading that into an SQL server. Mm -hmm. And that's a process that, like, a lot of data scientists spend a lot of time working with, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know I certainly did. And that process can be fun. I, I always enjoy that kind of work, actually. If you um, know SQL. If, if you know SQL yep. and, and, like, some scripting languages, yeah. Yep. But it's um, it's hard to reproduce, mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, you know, it can be frustrating to have to go back and do it again and to be kind of, like, constantly updating these things. Mm -hmm. And so what I was looking for is a solution that would allow you to do this programmatically and automatically, mm -hmm. um, preferably in a cross-platform way. Mm -hmm. um, and and preferably without knowing much SQL necessarily. Sure. Um, so anyway, so the R package does exactly that. It downloads data um, from the internet, transforms it, mm -hmm. um, and then loads it into SQL. And then you can use the dplyr connections um, to like seamlessly work with it in R, mm -hmm. um, which has become the thing that I work with all the time. Yeah. Um, so that's what it does. And, and, and in a sense, you're practicing what you preach, right? This is what you want your students to do. You yeah. want them to identify problems yeah. that are worth working on and then to go out there and create some solutions. Yeah, um, some transparent, uh, you know, reproducible solutions, yeah. 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 Um, does this come up in your classes at all? Do you guys talk about not only how to um, extract value from this vibrant community around R, but how to contribute back to that? A little bit, yeah. I'd actually, lo I'd love for that to be like a bigger part of what we do, mm -hmm. um, is to build that. I, I'm a been a big open source software advocate or whatever 
mm-hmm. uh, supporter for, for a long time. And I would love for that to become part of the culture of just like, you're benefiting from using all this open source software, like you should be contributing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a couple of students now who are working on um, you know, special studies where they're actually building some of these packages. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love for that to be a bigger part of what we do, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's probably worth pointing out that it's not always like you have to be, have these like purely altruistic ambitions to like yeah. give back to the communi- community. Oftentimes, a good reason for contributing to open source software is you're using some, some software package, say an R package, and it lacks a particular no, feature right. that right. you that's need. Right. And like, you're like, okay, well, I can either go build something from scratch right. or submit a pull request on GitHub to add yeah. this one additional feature to this existing framework. Exactly. And sometimes it's the path of least resistance. Exactly. And it still benefits the community, but... Right. No, and the truth is that um, for most of us, you're better off contributing to somebody else's package than you are building your own anyway, because it's yep. much more likely to kind of have some legs. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. So um, maybe uh, going back to the education thing for a minute, um, I think we're kind of hitting on this indirectly uh, with the sorts of things that we're talking about. But as you look at like the way that we educate people in statistics, mm-hmm. um, what do you think is missing from a traditional stats curriculum. And I don't even Mm -hmm. necessarily mean like in a university setting, but Mm -hmm. I think we've developed this notion of what an intro stats curriculum should look like over the last hundred years. And um, yeah, in your opinion, what's missing or what should we be doing differently? Well, that's a, that's a that's a loaded question and a heavy question, but um, I'll give you a couple of thoughts. I mean, so as you said, you know, some of the stuff we've already sort of talked about, you know, for Mm -hmm. me personally, I believe that computing has to be a part of any statistics course. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know, if you if you want people to actually go out and practice statistics, like they need to have that computing mm-hmm. ability. Um, you know, I struggle sometimes with some of the some of the small sample tests that we that we talk about a lot. Give you some know, examples. Two sample t test and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, sometimes ANOVA, where um, you know, for me personally, in the work that I do, like those just are not like tools that I use very often. And so it's harder for me to, um, to, to spend a lot of time on those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, a lot of the students who take my classes are biology majors and, um, you know, psychology majors. And, you know, for them in their research, um, those tests can be useful. Mm-hmm. And so there's kind of like, I think, nationally in the statistics ed- education community is like some push and pull between um, you know, these things that we've been teaching for decades mm-hmm. that people are still using, but then also this desire to kind of like move things forward a little bit and um, be dealing more with larger, more interesting data sets. Sure. So moving from a situation where we're having students um, compute a T statistic mm-hmm. on pencil and paper right. to students working with a real world data set, building um, a, a, a a, a, a model that incorporates yeah. multiple vari- variables right. um, and doing this using a modern tool like R. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yep. And I think part of the problem is that, you know, the curriculum has been what it is for a long time. And so we have this tendency to just add. Mm-hmm. You, you can't just keep adding things, right? It's like something has to go. And, and it's not clear what those things should be, mm-hmm. um, frankly. But um, anyway, that's one of the things we're wrestling with. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Cool. So maybe let's uh, let's look a little bit more broadly um, at the R and the data science communities. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot going on right now um, mm-hmm. in both of those. Um, what are some of the most exciting trends that you see? Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, for me personally, like um, just the way that R Studio has developed, um, it has basically taken over. Like my word processing and my web development. Um, And that's been a a big win for me Mm -hmm. um, in having, in having that, uh, you know, a tool that can do all those things. Mm -hmm. I think, so again, you know, a lot of my background was in um, PHP programming for web development and SQL for database development. And so... Not known for their user friendliness. Yeah, right, (laughs) in either case. Um, (laughs) But, you know, the way that dplyr has been able to kind of blend, um, Mm -hmm. you know, what you're your workflow in R mm-hmm. um, with your SQL workflow mm-hmm. um, has been a big br- breakthrough. Um, 
And then, you know, our markdown, I think, has been, you know, just a huge leap forward in For terms of reproducibility. our ability to, to reproduce. And, and, you know, what is the point of that? It's not just um, transparency to the outside world, but it's also just replicability, like, for ourselves, mm -hmm. you know? So I used to do uh, a lot of work that would involve you write a query and then, you know, you pull the data back into R and you like make a plot and then you want to write it up. And, you know, uh, if that workflow had existed 10 years ago, <laughs> things would have been very different. Yeah, um, sure. And basically I do everything now in R Markdown. Okay, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and you're teaching these tools to your, your students as well. Yeah, every class, day one. every class from day one we use our markdown. Day two usually, but yeah. What's their response In initially? In terms of our markdown? Um, so there's, um, there's no resistance for sure. I think, and people, you know, at this point, uh, our students are able to pick it up pretty quickly. Because mm -hmm. um, at its basic level, like our markdown is not that complicated of a thing from the user perspective. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, people still get tripped up on the whole, like, there's your R Studio environment, and then there's your Markdown environment, which mm -hmm. is fresh when you you know knit HTML, mm -hmm. and you know students struggle with uh, that. I think a lot a lot of people are actually even unclear on the distinction between R and R Studio. There's that too. Right? And for people who are learning R in yeah. 2016, uh, it's highly likely that they've never even seen. They've never seen it exactly. Like R at the command prompt right. or the exactly <laughs> the the yeah, R GUI. Probably a good thing, but yeah. Yeah, no, I try to be very explicit that like there's three things we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. There's R, there's R Studio, there's R Markdown. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think in general, you know, th think about the alternative, right? So if you're not using R Markdown to do like statistical projects, um, you know, are you writing a Word document and like copy and pasting figures from R Studio like into mm -hmm. the, like you know like that is not working. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I haven't met any real objections at all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's all I've got. Okay. Thanks hey. a lot for stopping by. <laughs> My pleasure. All right. Yeah.